the language about people with dementia, us being the sufferers, we're not the sufferers, actually. I think the family members suffer far greatly than we do in terms mm -hmm. of real suffering. And I've been, you know, I've watched three people lose capacity, deteriorate. Um, you know, I sat with my young friend who had to go into a nursing home aged 54 with vascular dementia and uh, he'd lost all mobility and it would become incontinent and a whole range of other things that put him there, not just dementia actually. Part of it was poor care, poor hospital experience. Um, but, you know, I sat in a princess chair with his stepdaughter for 10 days while he starved to death. Now, I can tell you I suffered more than him because he was medicated with, I don't know, morphine or pethidine or whatever the hospice people were using. But I had to advocate for six months to get him palliative care. And I initially was told, well, we don't give it to people with dementia. Why would we do that? He go, well, they're dying. Just like, you know, if somebody's dying, they need palliative care. So we've had to advocate for stuff like that. And I still suffer over the loss of those people and the memory of how they changed. But, you know, even Dad, although he was angry about being in a nursing home, he was still Dad. He was still okay. Mm -hmm. I suffered a lot more than he did. So, so, so I think people with dementia mostly agree that we suffer some of the time, but it's not okay to label us as victims or as sufferers publicly. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. I'm Marianne Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. Join me each week to listen to one of our authors talk about their dementia journey, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Today's guest is Australian Kate Swaffer, a humanitarian and activist for disability rights in dementia and aged care. She is the chair, CEO, and co-founder of Dementia Alliance International, a global advocacy and support group for people living with dementia. Kate is also living with younger onset dementia diagnosed in 2008 at age 49. She has won many awards for her work, including the 2018 Australian 100 Women of Influence Global Leader and the 2017 South Australia Australian of the Year. Kate is an elected board member of Alzheimer's Disease International and a current PhD candidate at the University of South Australia. Her first dementia book, What the Hell Happened in My Brain, Living Beyond Dementia, and her second book, Diagnosed with Alzheimer's or Another Dementia, co-authored with Associate Professor Lee Fei Lo, were released in 2016. Since 2010, Kate has given many keynote presentations on dementia, human rights, disability, discrimination, the lived experience of dementia, loss and grief, and much more. In this episode, we discuss how she managed to complete two master's degrees and part of a PhD post-diagnosis, her life as an accidental activist, and how to break down the wall of silence that surrounds a dementia diagnosis. Well, hi, Kate. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. How are you today? I'm good, Marianne. Thanks so much for inviting me and for persisting. It's taking us a while to get here. Yes, you were on my guest list at the top when I started the podcast sometime last year. And we finally managed to get together. I was looking at your um, post on all authors, 
you were one of our very first authors to post with us. That was back in July, 2016. Oh my gosh. Almost five years ago. Yeah. So that was interesting. Can you tell me where you are? You're in Australia, correct? Yeah, so I live in Adelaide, Australia. So I've been living here since 1977 and uh, grew up in the country in South Australia, west of Adelaide, about six, seven hours west. Did my nursing training at Waiala, a regional hospital, and came to the city uh, wow. in 77 and ironically uh, worked in aged and dementia care and ran Adelaide's first dedicated dementia unit, which I now see as jail. It's what is it now? I now see a memory unit or a dedicated dementia section oh. of a nursing home as a jail. Whereas as a jail. Well, it was okay. Hmm. Okay. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we can talk about that, I guess. Um, uh, I mean, historically, people with dementia were mostly uh, only, it was only really talked about when you were late stage and you went into, people went into nursing homes often quite late in their dementia. I mean, uh, in my nursing training, I only, I don't even remember having any real training about dementia, but I think that we are now where we were with cancer 30 or 40 years ago. We're just coming out of the, the darkness of dementia. Um, but, you know, we, we were told it was senile dementia or pre-senile dementia, and, and I hadn't nursed any young people with dementia. I didn't know young people got it. Um, and, you know, when I first started working late stage dementia and we called them patients back then whereas we don't now unless you're in hospital not really seen as a patient in a nursing home you'd be termed as a resident in australia it's your home so you're a resident um and you know the more late stage people with dementia were shackled to beds and chairs mm -hmm. so to have them um you know it seemed a positive step to have a, a a secure unit or, you know, area in the nursing home where they could walk around freely uh, and not be shackled to beds and chairs. Um, but now that I have been a care partner and legal guardian for three people with dementia who've all died in aged care uh, and live with a diagnosis myself, I see that as jail, not as good practice at all and the only other people in Australia that get locked up without all sorts of legal loopholes having to be jumped through um, are convicted criminals so why are we locking people up based on a disease that seems pretty bad to me yeah. So I campaign a lot about the deinstitutionalisation of people and when people say, but we've got no choice, we have to keep people safe, uh, I still say that's a breach of many, many, many human rights and that we just have to do better and change. And there are some places, at least in Australia, who are doing better. And what are they doing differently? They're, they are housing people with and without dementia uh, in small community homes. They look like your home or my home down the street. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have great big aged care facility sign at the front door. They don't isolate people with dementia and lock them away specifically. Just like my home, uh, the front door is locked when I'm at home to keep people out, but the, lock, the back doors are not. People can go in and out as, as they wish. They have uh, double beds, not single beds. I mean, I haven't slept in a single bed since I was a student nurse. Uh, so they have beautiful en suites. Some of them have balconies of their own. If I needed to go into one tomorrow, my husband could stay with me and obviously pay for that accommodation, but he could live with me there in a double bed with me until I died. Now, that's mm. got to be better care than a great big institution with almost no staff. So there, there is a new way coming um, and, uh, you know, it's not just about accessible de design or, you know, what, what the world is it fixated on dementia-friendly design. Mm. And there's nothing friendly about locked away and uh, isolated and segregated from the rest of the population. Those are all very good points. 
Um, what do you, what's your opinion on medications? I'm strongly against the use of antipsychotics mm -hmm. for people with dementia. In fact, if you look at the black box warning, which in most of the packaging around the world, it is on there. There's a black box warning that uh, the one contraindication for antipsychotics is dementia. But we mm -hmm. don't have that black box warning in Australia. And I think that the pharmaceutical companies have been very clever. You know, there's no, there's no cure or even disease-modifying drug yet for dementia. But we can sell drugs for anxiety, for aggression, for all of these other so-called symptoms of dementia, which actually aren't, I don't believe. In them. You know, the, the data would say that 95% of people experience BPSD, which is the behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. If that's the case, then 95% of the population need to be medicated for BPSC due to COVID isolation and restrictions. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. You know, yes, there are some dementias where, uh, you know, you have hallucinations or other um, uh, more severe uh, mm -hmm. symptoms, and they are due to the pathology of dementia, but most of the others are due to being isolated, locked away, having no family and friends visit you. Mm -hmm. You know, they have normal human responses that the rest of the world's allowed to have, but people with dementia haven't been allowed to have. So it's another way of looking at it. Yeah. Well, I agree with you looking back on my nursing experience. When I started in the 90s, we were restraining people. They had to wear these vests that had these long tails that we could tie around them and tie them into a chair or a wheelchair or into their bed and um, they couldn't get up they didn't have the freedom to walk around or anything like that and they were given medications to keep them quiet so that we they didn't disrupt yeah, and, Called chemical you know, restraints. yeah yeah chemical restraints and i remember when they did away with all that here in the states and then uh, the attitude was, well, they have the right to fall, you know, because we'd say, well, if we don't restrain them in the chair, they'll fall. And the answer was they have the right to fall. Yeah, but uh, I don't think in the States yet it has been done away with. The Human Rights Watch did that report a couple of years ago on um, mm -hmm. the incidence of chemical restraint in nursing homes in America. It's still very high. It's very high in Australia. The chemical, um, yes. My when I was working, we got rid of all those vests and everything. I remember they threw them away. But um, I had my stepfather in a facility back in um, 2017, 18, and he was very heavily medicated because if he wasn't, he was just he was unmanageable. But I think a lot of that was his rage. He was enraged that he, you know, was taken from his home and had to stay in this place for. Because nobody, there was no one to care for him at home and he couldn't be by himself. So, mm. but they did keep him on a lot of drugs. They would call me and ask me and, you know, your hands are tied. I didn't know, oh, it's an know awful what to do. Situation. It was we, awful. We were, in, we were in the same situation with my father-in-law, except the nursing home never bothered to ring and ask us, if, is it okay to put him on anything? Mm -hmm. They just did it without permission. Um, yeah. Without any and so there's a lot of that happening and, and in Australia certainly I don't know about the rest of the world as the uh, overuse and misuse of these psychotics has become so prominent um, uh, other sedat sedating medications are now being prescribed in said so you know benzos and antihistamines and things like that so we've just moved from one nasty chemical restraint to a new set. So we're going to have to deal with that at some stage too. Right. So how many years did you work as a nurse in that environment? Uh, uh, less than a year. I moved from there into uh, operating theatres and loved it so much I stayed there for about, I don't know, yeah. 20, 25 years, something like that. Yeah, mm. operating room nurses tend to do that. I, I was too soft for aged care. I grew up with a lot of... Uh, spending a lot of time with older family members and in many ways I actually prefer to hang out with older people than people my own age, even now in my 60s. Um, I just love the wisdom of older people 
And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my friends, like close friends, are in their 80s and 90s. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. It doesn't matter. Um, All right. So um, you went into uh, working in the surgical suite, and was that when you were diagnosed? No, no, I, that was years ago. So I finished working in theatre uh, in 1995, a long time ago. And then I switched careers, became an uh, a chef for 10 years. Oh, um, wow. Worked in my own business. Um, I was working as a, a regional manager and executive in healthcare sales when I was diagnosed with dementia. So I was, and how did that come about? Uh, uh, unusual experience to most people. Most people, especially younger people, have a lot of trouble getting a diagnosis, partly because they have a lot of trouble getting a, a family doctor or a practitioner to refer them on to someone, you know, not believing um, their cognitive changes. I didn't even suspect I had dementia, to be honest. I had had brain surgery in early 2005, and when I started having some strange symptoms like an acquired dyslexia, um, I thought that was a side effect of the brain surgery. And um, I'd worked for neurosurgeons for a couple of years. So, you know, it's a pretty impactful surgery. Um, it's a bit we used to talk about it being like a brain injury, it's assault on your brain. Um, mm -hmm. And so I didn't even talk to my GP about it. I was on six monthly regular checkups with a neurologist and just mentioned to him that I had these strange changes and thought, you know, uh, asked were they a side effect of the brain surgery. So I didn't probably start testing for dementia for another, I don't know, 18 months after I first mentioned it. But even then I didn't realise I was being tested for dementia. So it took a couple of years then of multiple testing and retesting to get a diagnosis, which came uh, in 2008. And uh, I didn't really like the diagnosis, so I asked for a second opinion and flew to Melbourne and saw neurologists and neuropsychologists and got retested there, um, only to be told the same thing. Um, and I don't know what, I don't think in other countries that people who get diagnosed have to be retested every year or so. We get retested quite often in Australia. And, you know, it's a weird thing. Every time I get retested with the SPECT and MRI and sometimes PET scans and the neuropsych testing, every single time I think, God, I hope, I hope they find it something else. Yeah. I really prefer it was something they could treat or cure. Um, but, you know, I've been tested since diagnosis at least 10 times and they keep telling me the same thing. So mm -hmm. I guess um, sooner or later you've got to believe it. And, I mean, it took me a while to believe it and a second opinion to, for it to really sink in. Um, but, uh, you know, it costs a lot of money in Australia in the private sector to be tested and retested. So sometimes I wonder about the value, but my doctor always says, well, it's important from his perspective to monitor what's happening in my brain. But also if I, if I suddenly take a plumber and get worse, then he's got like a documented record of, of what's been happening, which would help me access higher services. So that's kind of a catch-22. Mm -hmm. So is this something that you have to pay for yourself or do you have health insurance? How does that work there? Uh, even with health insurance in the private sector, there's usually a huge gap. Mm -hmm. So every MRI probably costs me, I don't know, 500 bucks out of my pocket. It's mm. not cheap. No, mm. that's not cheap. So do you have private health insurance or is it government funded? That's, that's with private health insurance. So we have with government private. funded and private. Um, and even in the private sector, uh, if you have private health, then that means you 99% of doctors in private practice charge hefty gaps in this country. So, mm. Mm. It's certainly a problem, I think, everywhere not only mm. for that level of care, but even just for day-to-day -day care for people oh, to have yeah, exactly. services. It's a problem. Mm. Um, what made you decide to write about your dementia? Um, 
Well, it's kind of a few funny little things. I, I, uh, one of my nieces had said you should write about your life um, for the kids and for the family. And uh, then I, I think I watched the movie Julie and Julia. Mm-hmm. It was like being a, a foodie, I, which uh-huh. I love that movie and book. And I thought, oh, well, she, you know, maybe I should do something like that. And then an old school friend had started doing a daily um, blog, but with online iPad drawings. And so between the three of them, I decided that I would start a blog, really. And I didn't, I don't know, I was so naive. People say to me, I can't blog. What's a blog? Well, it's just a website. And people can access it. And I was so naive about it. I didn't think I realised that the whole world would be accessing it. Um, And I I realised it took me about three months to work out how to post a blog. And then uh, within a few weeks, my family had started reading it. And I realised it was a really important kind of conversation tool. Because before that, sometimes my husband would come home and say, you know, how's your day? What have you been up to? And on the bad days, if I couldn't remember, it's kind of a bit of a blank. Whereas he could say, oh, I read on your blog, blah, 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 blah. So um, yeah. it became, uh, I just I decided to do a daily blog really to get into the habit of writing, but also the practising posting a blog I found very hard. So I thought if I practise it for a year, it'll have to become relatively easy, which mm-hmm. yeah, it's still a bit complicated, but it's easier than it was. And after, a, I don't know how long, two or three years, uh, a publisher in the UK, Jessica Kingsley Publisher, contacted me and asked me, well, I'd like to write a book. So that's kind of how I, I got into book writing. Um, but I had already published a poetry book in 2012. Um, writing just became an extension of my life, I guess. And had you been writing before that? No, no, I've been working mostly. Um, I've been at uni as a mature age student for fun. Uh, so I was doing a lot of, I was doing a writing degree uh, mm-hmm. and a Bachelor of Psychology. But I was only doing that for fun, kind of, you know, much better midlife crisis outcome mm-hmm. than having an affair. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> True. So with writing, uh, if you do you find that if you take time away from your writing that it's hard to get back in again? Do you forget uh, how to type or anything like that? I am lucky that I learnt to type in second year high school and to the old-fashioned touch typing where we had to wear this thing over mm-hmm. our um, shoulders that covered the keyboard. So mm. I, I, if I lose my typing skill because I can touch type without having to see the keyboard, uh, then I will be devastated because without typing I would struggle, I really struggle with handwriting now. I can still write but I can't read it afterwards and I uh, can't, it's not very easy now. So whilst that skill is intact, I'm okay um, because of Dementia Alliance International being so busy and us having basically you know, almost no funding and no paid staff. I do a lot of the operational work for DAI and that's taken my headspace time and just time, physical time, to write. Um, so when I, um, and I do plan to step down from a leadership role at the end of this year, um, then I probably will go back to more writing. I do a lot of private writing still, just not for public consumption writing. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little more about Dementia Alliance International? Yeah, uh, Dementia Alliance International is a global, um, I suppose, advocacy and support group for people diagnosed with any type of dementia from any age. Some live in nursing homes, some are in their 20s and 30s, some are in their 90s. Um, We were a group of... uh, eight people who decided to found it. Some of us had met in London at a conference there in 2012. Um, And I guess why we founded DAI was because, number one, we were sick of people without dementia telling us how we felt and what was best for us and organisations, the wealthy charities, providing no services for us Mm -hmm. other than very paternalistic 
services, but still really no services. So we set up our, we were doing support groups online long before COVID, before we even found it, we were hosting online virtual support groups with people around the world. Um, but we decided that we wanted to have a group where the voices of people with dementia wouldn't be diluted by the voices of people without dementia. And the first global group of people with dementia, they allowed family members and care partners to be full members and it didn't take very long and the family members and care partners were running the group. So it really wasn't quite so much a group for people with dementia. Um, and so we do have, uh, well, four, if you include my husband, and we don't, he doesn't like to be publicly spoken about as a volunteer. He's a bit shy about it. Um, we've got four volunteers. And even then, we have to be really careful that they don't just take over because you take I mean, I've, I've been a family care partner. You take over with the best of intentions and actually further disables people. So um, it's, you know, it's grown. We've got members in about 49 countries now. We run uh, almost seven days a week. There's a support group on somewhere. Um, and we have done advocacy at sort of the highest levels, up to the UN and the WHO. Um, and in some ways, as I've been doing that global advocacy, I've said, sat back and scratched my head a little bit and wondered why the wealthy charities haven't been advocating as much for what the needs of people with dementia are. Um, it's been a fascinating, interesting journey. Yeah, sounds fascinating. I'm going to have to take a closer look at it. I was looking at the website earlier. Mm. It's kind of like Al's author as we started it. You know, there's just seven of us now that run it to our assistant managers, five managers, and we have a very small budget as well. So trying mm. to keep that going every week, putting in it's a new hard. author, doing the podcast, doing events. So we got a lot going on too, but I know what it's like. It's a lot of work, but it's good. It's good work. It keeps you active and busy and it's something that you care about, passionate yeah. about it. Yeah. And you'll have, it's like your legacy. And I think the, the I've done a lot of media work over the years and, and articles in you know magazines and um, newspapers and so on. And, and often people will ask me, what's the most important work that I do or DAI does? And I would say that it is supporting people newly diagnosed with dementia. It's not the UN staff. It's not the staff. WHO, I mean, that's important, mm -hmm. and that has helped create a little bit of change, not a lot yet, but a little bit. But when you get diagnosed with dementia and there are uh, every, a di new diagnosis somewhere in the world every 3.2 seconds, and people with dementia say that, that what that means is every 3.2 seconds, somebody's life is metaphorically thrown in the bin. You are diagnosed, often the diagnosis has been very difficult. You are then stigmatised, discriminated against. For example, I disclosed I had dementia, I lost my job. How is that mm. an okay thing to happen? But worse than that, nobody in the dementia space said to me, you have rights as a person with disability. You should take that employer on. Nobody said that. Everyone just said, give up work, give up study. It'll be too hard for someone with dementia. Get your end of life affairs in order and get acquainted with aged care. That's it. And I've been, you know, I termed that, I gave it a trademark, a, a theory of prescribed disengagement. The doctors can't prescribe you with a disease-modifying pill or a cure. Yes, some people can have the Alzheimer's drugs, but even then, at best, they might slow dementia down for a couple of years. They're not a cure and they're not disease-modifying like a diabetes drug. So they can't give you a prescription that really does anything, so they prescribe you nothing. In fact, they throw your life in the bin. 
and uh, everybody around them. So my doctor didn't do that. He just did the diagnosing bit. But every healthcare professional or service provider or advocacy organisation I saw afterwards told me to give up living and get ready for the end. How is that okay? It's absolutely not okay. And, it's the, and yet people with dementia who become new members of DAI tell me 13 years after it happened to me, it's still happening. That's not okay. It's a major breach of our human rights because I know if they were diagnosed with cancer, even if they were quite, you know, almost no treatment for them, they would be supported to live their best life for as long as they had. And they'd been, you know, a whole range of other services would have been provided from counselling to grief and loss to, you know, you name it, it would have been there on a plate. But with dementia, you get nothing and you still get nothing. Mm. And that's not okay. No, that's not okay. And I know just working with all the authors and doing the podcast, especially, I've interviewed a lot of others like yourself who were diagnosed with the young onset, and they have so much life to live and so much to give. It's really astounding. And, and that so do older people, you know, when one of my family members, she only died earlier this year, not from dementia, but she did have mild, very early stage, I guess, the more common uh, older age Alzheimer's when she first uh, decided to see if she could get some in-home help. The staff just, well, they never, they sent a, a different staff member every day. So she never got to know them. She always like a stranger coming into her house. Mm. That's not okay. No. Um, but all they wanted to do was shower her and make sure she'd taken her medication. Well, she was still capable of showering almost to the very end. She wanted somebody to take her down to her church to volunteer because she'd been teaching painting and doing other volunteering for 70 years. She just wanted somebody to get her down there. And I mean, I had to fly over to the place she lived and advocate really hard for that to happen. She just wanted to keep living her life, not have someone take over. So we do this to anybody with dementia at any age. Families take over with the best of intention and, and we oh, I've done it we did it with love we thought we were mm -hmm. doing the right thing um and and service providers take over they completely disable and disempower people further and that's why so many people just become apathetic and give up you know I go to lots of forums where you know we're wanting the voices of the organizations wanting the voices of the family care partners and the person with dementia and you'll be sitting around a room in a focus group and the person with dementia will say nothing and the partner, the wife or the husband will completely say everything for them. And then in the coffee break or the lunch break, they're talking to you as if like we're talking to each other, they're talking to me. And I say, well, why don't you speak during the group? Oh, I can't be bothered. You know, if I mix up my words or if I take too long, then my wife or my husband just gets cross with me in the car on the way home or just talks over the top of me or says I'm embarrassing. And so many responses like this. So they say, why bother? Mm. It's kind of, a, it, it promotes learned helplessness, us taking over. Mm. It doesn't help. It makes it worse. And it does, I think, it's a lot of the reason for the apathy. That's a lot to really think about, Kate. You've given us a lot to think about here. And you've been busy working on trying to make changes. Do you work like legislatively in your country? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I, I'm very much an accidental advocate and I, I don't, and an accidental author really. And I don't see myself as an advocate now. I'm much more of an activist or campaigner, depending on which country you're in, um, as to the term you would use. But you know, I started speaking out by accident. I'd done an article about living with dementia for my university course. And I'd asked a friend who was an editor of a disability magazine to read it, see what she thought of it. And she liked it so much, she published it. Mm -hmm. And so it was a public magazine. And then I got asked to go and speak to some healthcare staff in nursing homes, a group of nursing homes. And I was so nervous about doing that that I, um, because I'd lost my licence after dementia, 
um, I had to have transport to get there. So the girl that took me, I asked her to read my article to the staff and then I took questions. That was kind of how I started. And, and I, I was a speaker at outside of Australia's first uh, political kind of rally on the steps of Parliament House back in, I don't know, say 2010. I'm not 100% sure that's the year. Um, and that, that was their first public rally. Um, they're now called Dementia Australia. And so I did a lot of uh, advocacy work with them, unpaid work. Um, but I realised that even at the local and national level, actually almost nothing was changing. And that's why I started to sort of head to the global space and then indirectly took DAI with me. And I thought, well, maybe if we can get it to change at the top, that'll eventually filter down, maybe not in my lifetime or my children's lifetime, maybe my grandson's lifetime. Some of that stuff will, will filter down into legislative policy, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the lack of rights for people with dementia is truly horrific. I'm invited all the time to uh, be on, you know, work for organisations where everybody else is funded. And even yesterday I was asked to join um, this working group and some focus groups and I said, are you paying advocates? Oh, no, of course not. And the person laughed as like it's funny. Now, this is not funny. No. Outside of the dementia sector, people are willing to pay me for my time and expertise still. So the, the stigma and the discrimination is actually within the very sector that says it's meant to be working for me to improve things. That's where it is. That's where the stigma and discrimination is. It's not outside of the dementia space. Wow. So it's pretty, you know, I've got a couple more books in me yet and I, I've written oh, a couple of books and I've got two poetry books published. I've definitely got two more dementia books in me. One is one is about the global advocacy movement and how it hasn't really moved anything yet. And, you know, it's based on the old saying, if you keep doing the same thing and you get keep getting the same results and you're not happy with those results, then who's the stupid one? If you keep doing the same thing, you won't get the same results. Yeah. So um, something has to change somewhere. Mm. Mm hmm have you started writing those books or are there still ideas? No, I have started writing. I've got some memoirs somewhere in there as well and uh, mm -hmm. I've got a private website that I just write in two or three different things. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe one day. I don't know. Maybe, maybe yeah. not. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, you could always hire somebody to do the writing part. Some of our authors have done that. They just tell them. They just talk it out, and then the other person writes it out. That the talking that. The that hard for me. Yeah, uh, my thinking and words come through my fingers okay. much yep. quickly than talking. I have thought about that, but it. In fact, I've tried it, and it just hasn't worked. And the second somebody prompts me, then I lose track of what I'm trying to say. So, okay. I, I, for me, it's better to just sit. And let the right. words come through the keyboard. Mm. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. How have, have readers responded to your book? I've had, uh, I, I suppose everyone gets a couple of bad uh, reviews, but mostly really, really positive. Um, and the most positive are probably from people with dementia. Um, and lots of DAI members have joined because they've read my book and they say, oh, wow, you know, you, you've taught us that we can live with dementia, not just go home and die from it. Um, so I, and I, I, it's, it's a strange book in a way. Uh, it's not autobiographical. It's not academic. It's, I don't know, it's a bit of everything, the book. It's a bit of my story. It's a bit about, you know, the chapters. Some of the chapters are really short. Um, and uh, I think my publisher, and topical, so I've talked about loss and grief. I've talked prescribed disengagement I've talked about stigma I've talked about language a whole range of things and the publishers I think thought it would be a bit disjointed and in fact people with dementia have told me that they really like it so if if they want to know something about grief they can just go to that chapter and yeah. you know that, that that's probably my biggest chapter is on the loss and grief that people with dementia feel over the loss of abilities and that's not been you know, there is no support for our loss and grief. 
the support for the family members loss and grief, but nothing for me. How is that? How is that okay? It isn't. So, yeah, you know, if, if you're a high-functioning human being or, you know, it doesn't matter, a functioning human being and suddenly you can't remember your children's name or you can't remember all of the composers that you used to be able to know, there's a lot of grief in that for me. Mm-hmm. It's not grief for the other people. In fact, it's worse for me, I think, and mm-hmm. it's not even a competition about whose grief is worse. Our grief has been completely ignored. Mm. So even now I cannot find a loss and grief course uh, through the organisation that supports people with dementia and families in my country that's for people diagnosed with dementia. There isn't one. Um, And that, you know, it's significant. Every time you lose a bit more of your capacity, it's another deep grief. It really is deep grief for the person diagnosed with dementia. And if you think about, you know, I think about my father-in-law and the other two people who I supported and was legal guardian, their anger or their sadness or their apathy or all of these other so-called symptoms. And I, I was a volunteer grief counsellor for nine and a half years um, supporting people bereaved through suicide. Um, My first long-term partner took his life when I was 27 and um, without me realising it, Adelaide was the hub in the world for suicide and uh, I joined a group that had just started a bereaved through suicide support group in 1986. David died in 85 and then did it furthered my education in grief um, and loss. And I was thinking about, you know, when I got diagnosed with dementia, I started thinking about the grief, I suppose, because I had a background in grief and, I, you know, I lost a partner to suicide. So, I, you know, I knew a lot about grief personally as well. And, and I started to say, well, a lot of this stuff I'm feeling, it's, it's not a dementia symptom. It's nothing to do with the pathology of dementia. It's to do with my loss and grief over suddenly, you know, I was a near-perfect speller. I can't spell that anymore. Now, I'm over that now, but to start with, it wasn't just confusing. It was really sad. But nobody's supported me ever with any of the law. I've had to do it myself. And so that's a lot of why DAI started. We have had to do it ourselves because nobody else was doing it for us. And that's one of the benefits of COVID, and I really hope it continues. A lot of the rich charities, the wealthy organisations, are starting to run, they have been running online support groups for people with dementia, not just for families. And I really hope they continue because we can't do the whole world. It's not possible for DAI to keep doing that. Um, we just don't have the person power. Um, but, you know, there's so much stuff missed out in the grief story that's relevant to, to specifically to people with dementia. You know, the, the language about people with dementia, us being the sufferers, we're not the sufferers, actually. I think the family members are, suffer far greatly than we do in terms mm-hmm. of real suffering. And I've been, you know, I've watched three people lose capacity, deteriorate. Um, You know, I sat with my young friend who had to go into a nursing home aged 54 with vascular dementia and uh, he'd lost all mobility and and would become incontinent and a whole range of other things that put him there, not just dementia actually. Part of it was poor care, poor hospital experience. Um, But, you know, I sat in a princess chair with his stepdaughter for 10 days while he starved to death Now, I can tell you I suffered more than him because he was medicated with, I don't know, morphine or pethidine or whatever the hospice people were using. But I had to advocate for six months to get him palliative care. And I initially was told, well, we don't give it to people with dementia. Why would we do that? He go, well, they're dying. Just like, you know, if somebody's dying, they need palliative care. So we've had to advocate for stuff like that. And I still suffer over the loss of those people and the memory of how they changed. But, you know, 
Even Dad, although he was angry about being in a nursing home, he was still Dad. He was still okay. Mm-hmm. I suffered a lot more than he did. So, so, so I think people with dementia mostly agree that we suffer some of the time, but it's not okay to label us as victims or as sufferers publicly, even though some of the time our experience is of suffering. But, you know, I would say that I suffer more from pain, from uh, arthritis and the chronic progression of my brain malformation than I ever do from dementia. What's the most difficult part of having dementia is actually no disrespect meant people without dementia. I find that the most difficult to cope with. Uh, People's attitudes towards us and misperceptions and assumptions about us, about our capacity, um, their behaviours and reactions to our changes as opposed to my changes are harder for me to cope with. Um, And the ease with which the whole world thinks it's okay to discriminate, segregate, isolate, lock us away, And that's what bothers me about dementia, not dementia itself. Hmm. I lost my job. No one will pay me for my time and expertise in the dementia space. You know, that's not reasonable. Worse than that, people think it's unreasonable that a person with dementia would expect to be paid for expertise time. That's extraordinary. That is extraordinary. Oh, my goodness. And and I know that if I say no to something, like being involved in in a focus group or as a consultant in a project about dementia, I know if I say no based on them not paying me, then I'll be discriminated against and excluded. Fact. So I have to do it for free to have a voice. That is not okay. I've yeah. even been told to my face, if you don't want it for free, there's thousands of others who will. But meanwhile, wow. the, the physicians are and the researchers are probably getting paid for their time. And it's not just the researchers and physicians. It's everybody. It's everybody. It's everybody. Everybody yeah. else is getting paid. Everybody. And that's an issue. And a voucher, a $30 voucher, I've received some vouchers in the last two years. One is I have to download it into an app. I can't work out how to do that, even with help. And the other I try to use, and I don't even know how to use them. I've taken them into the post office where they came from. They don't know how to use them. So why give complicated things to people with dementia anyway? That makes no sense. Yeah. No, exactly. And it's kind of insulting, $30 for 30 hours work. That's about a minute an hour. Wow. Oh, that's insane. And we're meant to be grateful. Mm -hmm. It's pretty extraordinary. So uh, in in the mental health space, they are far, far more advanced, at least in Australia, in terms of recognising and paying for advocates with lived experience. So dementia's got a long, long way to go in mm. that space. I'm thinking about what you said at the beginning when you said that when people were diagnosed, they were usually much older and in poorer condition. I don't think they were expecting all of these younger people who were still active and no, had I don't a voice. Think were, yeah. Who come yeah. out and, now. And, and like what DAI has done, because we have members living in nursing homes, older members, younger members, we are empowering older people to speak up too. An example of that is uh, a lady living in a nursing home in another state in Australia who's a member, um, and she she put herself into a nursing home. She doesn't have a partner. She didn't want to be a burden to her kids, so she thought, oh, I'm going to go into care earlier, so, you know, so it's easier. Um, and with the COVID lockdowns, she really needed to go walking for her mental health, physical health, psychosocial health, all of the above. Um, And when she tried to gain access to going for her daily walk, they, you know, locked her in 
And, you know, we wrote a letter from DAI advocating for it, quoting all sorts of stuff from the CRPD and human rights, you know, other conventions. And that letter must have scared the nursing home. It ended up on the federal minister's desk in Canberra. It took two or three mm. months for a response. But through that advocacy, she's allowed to go walking. But why should it take that long? Mm. Why should you have to go to that length just to have access to the outside world? That's extraordinary. So there's, you know, but what that's also done is it's empowered her to have a voice. So now she doesn't need us so much to have a voice in the nursing home. She lives and she speaks up for herself and they're not used to it. No. And she's speaking up for other residents there. Oh, boy. There's like this ripple effect. So she's, you know, labelled a troublemaker by some people. Um, and, that, you know, you're allowed to be an advocate everywhere else for yourself or for others, but not with dementia, it seems. Uh -huh. this, this is the funniest you know, there's about 20 PhDs in, in my 13 years of dementia, definitely. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> You're setting the world on fire. <laughs> oh, God, I hope so. Some, some people would say I'm just a pain in the neck. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oh, yeah. my. So I think that... Um, I was going to ask you because you, you mentioned your husband. So you have your husband with you and, and you have children as well? Yeah. When I was first diagnosed, the kids were living at home. Mm -hmm. um, they were, I can't remember whether they were 16 and 17 or 17 and 18, but, you know, late teenagers. So uh, I've had a lot of other fairly serious health conditions. So when we sat down to tell them about me having dementia and we've been very open in our family, perhaps more open than the average family, I think. Um, and, you know, to them it was, oh, God, not another thing mum's got. But, you know, my youngest son, and we've, we've used humour throughout. Our, uh, we were a Brady Bunch. My husband and I met through our two kids who were really good friends when they were like three-year-olds. Um, so there's only 10 months between our boys. Um, but Charles said, the younger one, said, oh, my God, Mum, isn't that a funny old person's disease? <laughs> and we sort of laughed, even though it wasn't very funny. Um, but, you know, the stigma affected them too. So when I'd had brain surgery, um, the school community that where the boys went to school, the parents and friends group, we have really active PNFs at our schools in Australia, probably everywhere in the world. And the, the parents and friends group... Um, and we'd done this for a, a, another child in, in one of my son's classes, the younger one, when his mum was dying of cancer. We provided five-day-a-week meals for that family, just dropped it at an esky at the front door, Monday to Friday. We took a roster, you know, if you're cooking for five people, what's another three? Um, and so when I had my brain surgery, the school PNF were really proactive. They provided weekday meals for our family for three months, they, without me asking, they proactively provided a psychologist for the kids if they needed it, et cetera, et cetera. The support was remarkable. When we told the school I had dementia, and I didn't know this until a year later, and, and I was involved on the sidelines of a project through one of the universities in Sydney, a master's research project on the impact of young onset dementia on the kids of people with yod and one of the well, the main research of the master's student had said to me oh i'm putting on this um seminar and i want young people to talk would one of your sons come up and you come up as well would one of your sons be prepared to talk about his experience and uh, the younger one did. Uh, I mean, I, I sobbed pretty much, cried myself to sleep for a month afterwards. Mm. You know, he stood up. The first speaker, um, he, we were in the back row. He was crying all the way through. He's going, oh, mum, that's just like me. That's just how I felt. That's like it was just like this. It's like a support group. When we have a DAI support group and a new member turns up and they hear us sharing, they go, oh, yeah, it's just like that. It puts kind of a normalness about what you're feeling. You don't feel so alone. But Charles got up and he presented. And one of the most profound things he said probably was that, and he 
talked about when his mum, me, when I'd had the brain surgery and how much support he got at school. And then he talked about this wall of silence mm. when we told the school he had, that I had dementia. So, you know, if you've had kids and you've dropped them at school, you know, before the teacher arrives, it's a really super noisy, everyone's yak, yak, yak. And Charles shared on this day, he'd walk into a classroom and it would go dead quiet. Mm. Talked about the wall of silence. No counsellors stepped up or psychologists stepped up to offer proactive support. We didn't get anything in terms of extra support from the school. So there was no disrespect to those people. They're great, but some of them are friends with some of them still. And I didn't think about it and I felt really guilty afterwards. Why the hell didn't I think about saying to the school, hey, can you provide this extra support now for both my kids? I didn't think about it, but they didn't think about it and yet they did think about it when I had brain surgery. Why is that? And then my mother in an interview, she talked about this. She used the same term. So when I'd had, she lives, they lived in the country. My father's no longer alive, but... Um, when I had the brain surgery in 2005 and country, small country communities are usually very supportive of each other, people were dropping in every day, even doing food drops for my mum to find out how am I. And yet when she told people in her community that I had dementia, she used the term there was a wall of silence. People stopped visiting. People stopped talking about me extraordinary so that's the stigma and I say with Yod there's that's the two groups that are seriously missing support and services because yes I felt stigma and indirectly the kids felt stigma only because of this lack of support at school but the stigma experienced by older people around dementia is much worse than what I feel and we're you know they, they're not taken into the equation enough they're just starting to be in this country but not enough um, you know and we have a website in Australia for people with young the kids of yod but who's going to go to that you know they, they want a snapchat group or you know they want something that's relevant to their ages and the, and, and the area in which they live so I think there's two cohorts really missing out in support and services around yod and we miss out on support and services by the way but i think that these are two really invisible groups people don't generally talk about hmm. did you um come prepared to read anything from your book i certainly can read something from i would my love book. that that would be fantastic okay. um all right i thought i might actually just read a bit from the introduction uh so I'll start with that. So just like my first book of poetry, Love, Life, Loss, A Roller Coaster of Poetry, um, this book, the first book I wrote about dementia, is about my life but with a particular focus on living with a diagnosis of young onset dementia. Um, it's not really a specifically an autobiography. Uh, it's more of a book about how I feel living with dementia, of stories, thoughts from my heart, not only about dementia, it's not an academic book, nor specifically focused towards the healthcare sector. Um, I'm having trouble reading, sorry. My reading skills are not so good these days, Marianne. Right. Um, but I started writing about dementia, blogging initially, to remind me of who I really am, to keep tabs on my life, my thoughts, my philosophies, so that later on I would have a record of them, even if I could not remember what I was thinking or doing. Um, before writing and setting up my blog, I hadn't realised how important it might be to create a shared space where other people with dementia and our families and friends could talk about life, illness, dementia and our other ever-deteriorating abilities and where I could discover in the witness of others how my stories had been heard. Um, so it's been an interesting experience, really. Uh, what else should I read? Sorry, I'm having trouble reading. Um, I think the other, I'll read this little bit from page 24. 
The other reason I decided to write and speak out about what it is like living with dementia from the diagnosed person's point of view is that I'm tired of hearing and reading how much of a burden we are to family care partners, how hard it is for them, how we are fading away, how our challenging behaviours negatively impact them and how difficult the healthcare system finds caring for us in general. I'm tired of listening to or reading articles from people without dementia telling me how it is their right to lock people with dementia up or electronically track us. The rider, of course, is always that it is for our own safety. And, and so, I, you know, I, I talk about a lot of things in the book. Um, maybe I should just read a poem. That would be easier for me. There's one thing I've regularly said um, is that uh, we live until we die and so for the most part I try to live as well and as positively as possible to enjoy the days that I am alive. Um, and I've kind of revised that quote a little bit to add um, we are a long time dead so we should just focus on living. And whether you've got cancer or dementia or going through whatever, you better to focus on living uh, and living as well as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just trying to find a poem. I think when I was first diagnosed, Marianne, I, you know, I, I was spinning really, and I think many people with dementia talk about that. Um, you know, there's nowhere to go. There's not enough support. You don't really realise nobody expects to get dementia. No one's happy with that diagnosis, even if they know something's been wrong. Um and to come out of that with some sense of I can still live a life, it's really important for people to do that. Um, people have often asked me over the years, if you can only give one piece of advice to someone newly diagnosed with dementia, that probably is, and this is not out of my book, by the way, I'm just mm -hmm. randomly thinking while I while I try and find a poem, um, uh, I say to people, reclaim or demand to be supported to live your pre-diagnosis life or the life that you want to lead now. So for some people getting a terminal illness and dementia is a terminal illness, they just want to hit the bucket list and that is absolutely okay. I don't really have a bucket list. I've done most things I'd want to do on the bucket list anyway. Um, I just want to live the best life I can every day. Um, but people want you to stop living once you've got dementia. They take away your right to keep living your life. So demand access to keep living your life. And if that means disability access, and I, and I say accept a second D word, dementia is hard to take and accepting that you've got disability if you've not had disabilities before is quite a hard transition but once you realise that you have a lot of rights as a person with disability, particularly under the CRPD, and that you can demand those rights um, in law, then it gives you uh, many more strategies to demand support to keep living your life for as long as you can. And, you know, one of the lucky things for me was that I was a university student when I was diagnosed and the advocacy organisations and healthcare sector told me to go home and get my end-of-life affairs in order and give up living with no support for living with the disabilities caused by dementia. But when I was at university, and I talked about this to one of the psychology lecturers, do you think I should give up study? Everyone's telling me I should give it up. And she said, uh, no, we have a whole disability support service for all university students and we may not have supported someone with dementia but you are just a person with acquired disabilities now so she referred me there I got a letter from my neurologist confirming my diagnosis and right through two double degrees and a master's of science and partway through a PhD I've been supported with disability support proactive disability support from my university to keep living Kate Swaffer's life. And then I go, why the hell doesn't the healthcare sector do that? It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, outside of dementia and outside of health, 
I'm supported really well to live with disability. Inside that space, I'm told to go home and die. So I can't find a poem, so I'm going to have to go into the book. Maybe I'll find one there. But it's called Slipping Away. Life, slipping away, terrified, one day soon, I won't know my children. Life, slipping away, mortified, one day soon, I won't know my husband. Life, slipping away, disbelief, one day soon, I won't know my family. Life, slipping away, angry, one day soon, I won't know my friends. Life, slipping away, humiliated, one day soon, I won't know how to drive. Life, slipping away, despairing, one day soon, I won't know who I am. And, you know, I've moved on a lot from that sadness because a lot of it, yes, some things have started to happen. Um, I lost my licence within the first 12 months um, and I thought and I believed everything that all of the healthcare professionals told me, that my life was over as I knew it. And, yes, parts of my life were over as I knew it, but nobody told me you keep living a really good life even though it's different um, nobody believed that people with dementia can still learn. I, you know, I've had uh, my brain, I believe, has compensated. I was very, um, what side is the brain that's brain. analytical, maths, English? Anyway, whichever side is that is very disabled, but my creative side of my brain has really opened up and I didn't write poetry before dementia and some days I'll sit down and write 30 mm. poems. I don't even know where they come from. They just come out. Um, and so isn't that a gift? Well, you know, there are so many gifts of mm -hmm. dementia that nobody's talking about. Family members don't want to talk about them because it's too damn painful. But when mm -hmm. I talk to people with dementia, they talk about the gifts of dementia. Mm. Yes, we talk about the sadness. Yes, we talk about... How awful it is that we lost our job or we can't do our job. Like, I know I couldn't work in operating theatres anymore and I couldn't be a chef putting together food for 300 people on the spot. But there's heaps of other things I can do with and without support. So, you know, my husband and the two sons used to just take over from me the first couple of years and then I said to them, stop disabling me. And, and I started to call my husband my backup brain or my bub because he hates being called a carer or caregiver he says I cared for you before dementia and you know I say that to call him a carer or caregiver means that I'm the taker you know it's just, it removes any inequality in our relationship and so you know when I said I'm going to call you my bub my backup brain the younger son said that's the perfect analogy mum that's what we need to do if you imagine the backup on your computer you only go to that when it crashes. So that allowed my family to step back and then they only help when I ask. So I can't use a calculator, for example, and I used to fight with myself and maybe spend three hours trying to do some stupid simple maths thing and I used to be really good at maths. Why argue with myself over it? Why not just get somebody who can still do it to do it? And the only time they would step in is if it's dangerous, mm -hmm. and I'm happy with that. So it's just a new way of seeing the changing relationship between people with dementia and people close to them who don't have dementia. And, you know, I did think that all my dreams would be stolen and wrote a poem called Stolen Dreams, but they haven't. Some things I wanted to do have been stolen, but, you know, before dementia, there were things that suddenly I couldn't do or suddenly didn't want to do or the opportunity didn't arise. It's not much different after dementia. But people think it's like you're going to go to end stage straight away so you give up everything, and that's just not even logical. So, uh, you know, it's been a really, really interesting experience for me and, you know, my life before dementia was... Uh, busy and interesting and 
really meaningful and my life with dementia is still busy, interesting and really meaningful. But I've had to mm-hmm. fight for that to happen. Those are great words. Where can readers find your book? The second book, which is called A Diagnosed with Alzheimer's or Another Dementia, A Practical Guide to What's Next for People Living with Dementia, Their Families, Care Partners, which was co-authored with Lee Fei Lau, an associate professor in Sydney. Um, That's available only now on Apple Books. Uh, It was written specifically for an Australian audience just in terms of the um, services and support, but it's actually the book I wanted when I was first diagnosed. It explains... Mm-hmm. Uh, about getting a diagnosis it, and we did uh, we interviewed people and did focus groups for about 18 months to inform that book what do we what do people with dementia and their families want in it mm-hmm. um, uh, so that's about dementia it's about getting a diagnosis it's kind of very easy read about the different types of dementia it explains dementia as a disability explains the prescribed disengagement theory um, it we've got chapters on living alone with dementia we've got chapters on you know uh, I guess minority communities LGBTI culturally and linguistically diverse Uh, we've got interviews from all sorts of people with and without dementia a psychiatrist who thinks he's got the Alzheimer's gene and half of his patient cohort have dementia A, a, a woman a Muslim woman living in Australia who culturally really should go home to her country because her, I can't remember if it's her mum or dad's got dementia and, and the impact of that on her as a young woman with a career in Australia and two little kids not being able to go home to look after her mum, which is what her culture would expect. So it's, it, I think it's a very good book, the second one, but more practical. Um, so that they're both are available on Apple Books. The other book is available on Amazon in every country. Um, the first poetry book is only available through me for now and when I run out of stock it'll be available through the publisher Um, and the second dementia uh, poetry book is available through a publisher but I have a on my website a page for my poetry books and a page for my books so people can just easily go to my website for those details which is kateswaffer.com awesome well thank you so much I appreciate your time today You've certainly given our listeners a lot to think about, a totally different point of view than what we've experienced, I think. So I appreciate that and I'm grateful to you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. It's been really lovely to meet you online as well. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alzheimer's podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on Alzheimer's, please visit alzheimer's.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony.